here to talk about language because language is what I do and I do it for a living. I study it, I teach it, I read it, but otherwise I do exactly what all of us do to communicate. To communicate with you, with the past, and if some of what I've written survives, perhaps with the future. Now I'll start with a story from my childhood to give you a sense of what turns me on about language. I was 10 years old and my stomach was tied up in knots and I asked Sister Ethelbert in St. Stephen's parochial school on the south side of Chicago if I could be excused. What's the problem, she asked. Stomach egg, I said. <laughs> my pain had a very precise shape. It was yellow and shiny, and it looked exactly like the golden flavor nugget inside every box <laughs> of Mrs. Grass chicken noodle soup. And that was just one of the exotic delights of our new American experience. To my immigrant ear, words egg and ache sounded the same. And so forevermore, these two words occupy the same slot in my conceptual and emotional map of the world according to English. I didn't know it then, but I had stumbled across the magic of homophones, those tricky words that sound the same even though they don't look the same and that refer to completely different chunks of the universe. To this day, every time I hear someone say they have a stomach ache, I know it's because of Mrs. Grass's <laughs> golden flavor nuggets. <laughs> that little aha moment when ache became egg is, I think, where my interest in language as an object of study got its start. Now I spent a lot of time thinking about language in Japan last month. That was mainly because I'd never been so completely tongue-tied. It was as if I'd been disconnected from a life support system I didn't even know I was on. Without a word of Japanese in my brain, I felt like the soundtrack of my life had been switched off. There were people talking all around me, there was writing all around me, but all of it was just noise. Sound didn't merge with sense. Now I've traveled a lot among people whose languages I don't know, but I've always had somebody along who could translate for me. This time I was on my own because my travel companion was just as clueless as I was. And this muteness was new for me. I grew up in Trieste, a city on the Adriatic where God mixed up the languages. A third of the people spoke some version of Slovene. Slovene is a language that has two and a half million speakers and it's been placed on the UNESCO endangered languages list. A bigger third of the people spoke some version of Italian and the rest spoke Croatian and English thanks to the presence of the Allied military command that was sent there to keep order until 1956. So what was it like to grow up with all those languages around me? I guess if I were a fish, it would be like moving through different temperature zones. It's always the same medium, water, but it feels different. And depending on the level, it carries different sense data, different smells, different tastes, different textures. Moving through a city with many languages was like that. But in Japan, I was a fish out of water. I could make out some of the cute signs on the street. 
Uh, and I did not touch any geishas as a result. <laughs> and I think I was able to figure out something about the status and the occupations and the affect of the people around me by reading clothing, gestures, and facial expressions. I could insert myself into the spaces of Japan, <laughs> but I could not inhabit them. I could not access Japan, that Japan that resides in the language. That sense of being left outside made me think about James Baldwin, a radically alienated Negro homosexual, as he called himself, living in a remote xenophobic Swiss village in the early 1950s. It was there that Baldwin came up with what I consider a profound realization about language. He said, the root function of language is to control the universe by describing it. To control the universe by describing it. Now that's a pretty big claim. How can one control something as vast, as complex, as perpetually a work in progress that is the universe with a toolkit that in English is made up of these numbers. 42, 44, 26, 8, 250,000 to 750,000. 42 to 44 sounds, 26 letters, 8 parts of speech, noun, adjective, verb, adverb, pronoun, preposition, conjunction, and article, and 250,000 to 750,000 words. But with this meager toolkit, we actually construct a very complicated, very nuanced image of the world. That is what we humans do with language. When I'm teaching introductory Russian, I ask my th students to think of language as a super efficient, practical machine that is made up of a very small number of parts, of conceptual categories, and rules of combination. There are strings of sound called nouns that we use to carve up static entities out of the flux of the universe and of experience. There are things called verbs that designate dynamic processes. And I tried a long time ago, I'm sorry these are so dark, and I tried a long time ago to do an alphabet book that was all about verbs and not just about static nouns. A is apple, B is ball, Z is zebra. Uh, there are adjectives that describe qualities like soft and hard and warm and fuzzy. And then there are those amazing little words that we use to customize language to our particular moment, to our particular situation, the so-called shifters. Words like I and you and now and here that have no content and no meaning of their own, but they always derive it from the context in which they are used. I always means the person saying I at that particular moment, and so on. So out of all these bits of sound emerges all the reality that we think and talk and write in which we operate as if it were the real thing, as if it were the stuff behind the words we speak. All of our philosophical constructs and religious concepts, our ethical system, our legal categories, political notions, our very idea of what is a self, what is an other, all of these ultimately derive from language. This is the profound intuition at the basis of so many human creation myths. In the beginning was the word, begins the Gospel of John. This uh, is, there is another one, an ancient Egyptian account of the emergence of the first deity, Amun, from a word. 
When being began back in the days of the Genesis, it was a moon appeared first of all when he uttered himself into visible form. Or take Genesis 1 in which we're told that on six consecutive days, God speaks matter into being. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth and God said, let there be light and there was light. And God said, let there be a firmament, and it was so. And God said, let the waters be gathered onto one place, and it was so, and so on. So linguists call this kind of utterance a performative utterance because it actually makes something happen. It changes reality. Performative language is all around us. Think of the marriage ceremony. When you say the words, I do, your social identity, your legal status, and a host of other things change. And it's all because of those two words. It's this performative power of language that makes social order possible, that makes oaths work. But it's also what makes gossip and lies and slander so dangerous. Here's Hesiod, Homer's contemporary warning, try to avoid being the object of thought talk. A bad reputation is easy to get, difficult to endure, and hard to get rid of. The great Swiss linguist Ferdinand de Saussure proposed that not only do we humans use language to identify what for us is real, what exists for us, but also that the language we use in turn dictates, determines what we see, hear, feel, think, value, and act on. So let me give you a couple of examples that will show, I hope, how every language imposes its own reality. In English, here's a little bit of grammar, right? In English, we distinguish between one of something and more than one. And we do so generally by putting an S at the end of a singular noun. So there's dog, one canine, and then dog plus S is more than one canine. Now in my native language, Slovene, we have a three-way number system. We speak of one, two, and more than two. So English and Russian and a whole host of other languages that were Indo-European in origin all had this three-way system once upon a time, but they lost it, except for a few ancient words that we still have in English like both and neither and between, which all mean two things are in play. So if English still had the dual, it would come out as one hand, hand pair, and hands. In Slovene, we express the idea of a pair or a couple using the same basic word, but with a different ending. So we have roka, roke, and roki. All of your hands there. Uh, it gets a little fussy because you've got to produce all three forms for every part of speech, for all the nouns and all the verbs and all the adjectives and the pronouns and so on. But Slovene speakers stubbornly cling to this complicated three-way system because for us, it expresses something very, very valuable. My father, who was a professor of linguistics, wrote a wonderful essay on the meaning of the dual. He said it expresses the primordial understanding of the world as a dyad, as a dyad consisting of I and thou, that conveys a sense of we two-ness, we two alone, we two exclusive of others, stressing the unity, the solidarity, the merger of the two in exclusive terms. My other example comes from Russian. Russian has a grammatical way of expressing things over which one has no control, things that are faded, part of the human condition, a result of being a body in space and time, 
the result of being a body in a political order. To express this, Russians use something called the date of case. In English, we say, I am cold. But in Russian, this comes out as cold besets me. <laughs> in English, we say, I am 39 years old. You identify with the age, I am 39 years old. In Russian, 39 years have befallen me. <laughs> Notice it's possible to say something just like the Russian in English, but only a super bookish or a super dramatic person would do it this way. <laughs> but in Russian, that's just how it's said. And it's said this way because it renders and it models a cultural point of view on the limits of human agency in the face of insurmountable forces. So when you realize the profoundly nuanced ways in which language shapes our perception, our conception of the world, you wonder how is it possible in this globalized world order for people to understand each other's realities if they don't know each other's languages? Every language is its own model of the world. It's a repository of the ideas and the values and the concepts that the speakers of a language have accrued through time. In this sense, we can think of each language as a set of tinted glasses that lets in only certain parts of the complete color spectrum. You can imagine that wearing that single pair of glasses might have its drawbacks, which brings me to making the case for linguistic diversity, which I think is an analog to eco-diversity. The more languages in the world, the more nuanced are our collective wisdom and knowledge of the world, which is why when a language dies with the death of its last speaker, an entire world dies along with it. Now, on a brighter side, the more languages we speak, the more opportunity we have to enrich and complicate our grasp of reality and our way of being in the world emotionally and cognitively and intellectually and ethically. Each language gives us entree into a different modality of consciousness, and so it can be a superb tool for empathy, for really getting inside someone else's mind. If you're allergic to learning languages other than your own, you can still get that mind-expanding perk of polyglottism through translations and poetry. So I think we've all been conditioned to dismiss translation as a pale version of the original. But the philosopher Walter Benjamin invites us to reverse that verdict. He writes, somewhat mystically, it is the task of the translator to liberate the language imprisoned in a work in his recreation of that work. By that, he means that a translation teaches the original language something about itself that it does not know. Just like I need a mirror to see my own nose, English needs to see itself through and in Russian to discover new dimensions of its expressive power. Now, the case for poetry is a little less mystical. The Russian formalist critic Viktor Shklovsky wants us to understand that the job of the poet is to make language self-conscious, to make the familiar strange, and by twisting and complicating it with all sorts of tricks, rhythm and rhyme, uh, metaphors and similes, metonymies, alliteration, synecdoches, so that in straining to understand what the poem is saying, we're forced to confront the limits and the blind spots of our habitual use of language 
and to rediscover the world in all its strangeness that shimmers just beyond the reach of our words. Here's a poem by C.K. Williams. It's called Doves, and it speaks to the importance of words, and it demonstrates the work that poetry does to shake up language. Doves. So much crap in my head. So many rubbishy facts, so many half-baked theories and opinions, so many public figures I care nothing about, but who stick like pitch. So much political swill, so much crap. Yet so much I don't know and would dearly like to. I recognize nearly none of the bird songs of dawn. All I'm sure of is the maddening who, who, who of the doves. And I don't have half the names of the flowers and trees, and still less of humankind's myths, the benevolent ones from the days before ours, water-plashed wastes, radiant intercession. So few poems entire, such a meager handful of precise recollections of painting, detritus instead, junk, numbers I should long ago have erased, inane information I'll doubtlessly take with me to the grave, so much crap, and yet, now, morning, that first sapphire dome of glow, the glow, the first sounds of being awake, the sounds, a wind whispering. But even trucks clanking past, even the idiot doves. And within me, along with the garbage, faces, faces and voices, so many lives woven into mine, such improbable quantities of memory, so much already forgotten, lost, pruned away. The doves, though, the doves. It's funny, but when I ran this text through spell check, it kept wanting me to fix all the sentence fragments. <laughs> <laughs> now, C.K. knew his grammar, and if he breaks the rules in his poetry, he does so to make me work, to make me work to discover my own meaning within the framework of his fractured words. So I'm going to close with another story about a formative moment in my life that has to do with language. I call it the story of the acronym or how two letters can tell two different stories. And I think this is the next slide. Yeah. So my classmates in that same St. Stephen's parochial school introduced me to the acronym. This is an abbreviation, an acronym we all know, is an abbreviation that's formed from the two initial letters of words that's pronounced like a single word, D-P. The letter D and the letter P, D-P. The letters, my father tells me, stand for displaced person. I am a displaced person, specifically in my narrow historical frame, I am one of the eight to nine million people evicted from their homes by military operations, ethnic cleansing, genocide, political persecution and retribution in the aftermath of World War II. Two letters, two stories. There's the story told by my mother about May 6, 1945, when World War II came to die in the Balkans. It starts in Ljubljana, Slovenia. That day, my mother, a 21-year-old university student, newly engaged, her fractured shoulder still in a cast, was swept up in a mass evacuation of anti-communist Slovenes, members of the Home Guard, white Russians and Cossacks, all fleeing the Red Partisans under Tito, who, with the sanction of the Allied High Command, took control of Yugoslavia. 
In a light spring coat and fragile pumps, it was spring, she fled with her family northwest across the brutal Caravanque Mountains. So the red area is the mountains. Let's take a look at the mountains. The mountains between Slovenia and Austria, on foot, through snow and ice, strafed from the air, shot from the woods, to collapse on the bare earth of a muddy field in Austria. The British military authorities who met them on the other side gave them their word of honor that they would arrange to move them to safe havens in Italy and Austria. Instead, playing a high-stakes diplomatic game, they handed the refugees over to Tito. Told that they were being transported to Italy, the trusting refugees boarded especially guarded trains. But at the border, the train stopped. The Allied guards disappeared. Out of the woods swarmed armed partisans who pulled the men off the train, bound them in wire, piled them into trucks, and drove them deep into the forest where they lined them up on the edge of execution pits and in caves and mowed them down so that the dead suffocated those still living below. The fortunate ones, my mother among them, heard rumors of the fatal repatriation while still in Austria and stayed behind. Those whose lives were spared were imprisoned, tortured, deprived of civil rights, barred from all jobs, and labeled enemies of the people. Among them was my maternal grandfather, the expressionist poet Joža Lovrencic, who was silenced after having been jailed and beaten, and whose name was purged from the ranks of Slovene writers. In this story, D stood for deception and destruction, and P meant pain, lost home, lost family, lost identity. That was my parents' DP story. And in the years in Italy, it became my story, too. To me, the P came to spell pride, pride in the courage, endurance, and ingenuity of my mother and father. But in Chicago, DP was said with a snide inflection in a sing-song voice accompanied with finger pointing. DP was a label of shame. D, defective, different, you don't belong here, you're not one of us. P, pathetic, pooey, two letters, two stories, emotions, values with social consequences, sometimes profound consequences. That's one of the profound things that language does. It can hurt. And used intelligently, wisely, compassionately, it can prevent hurt. As Sigmund Freud said in Civilization and Its Discontents, the first human being who hurled an insult instead of a stone was a founder of civilization. I suppose it's this idealistic trust in the power of language to civilize, to nudge us away from brutality and closer to civility. That sense sends me back into the classroom year after year to teach American students Russian, a language that only few of them will ever truly master or even use so that they might glimpse a conceptual, conceptual and ethical and emotional world that's drawn somewhat differently from the one in which they grow. And it's Socrates' claim that expressing oneself badly does some harm to the soul that keeps me going as I edit page after page after page of bad student writing. <laughs> <laughs> and now at the end, I would like to give you a little present, a sort of party favor. And this will require you to speak up. So you're going to take a look at this slide, and you're going to read the tricolor print below the picture. And you're going to say those three English words quickly and the last one with a British pronunciation. So we're going to say this now 
Yellow blue vase. Yellow blue vase. Yellow blue vase. Marvelous. Let me hear you again. Yellow blue vase. You've done something amazing. You've done two entirely different things with a single utterance. In a single string of sounds, you have spoken in two languages. In English, you have named and described a container for flowers. And in Russian, using the correct formal form of address, you have respectfully told me that you love me. <laughs> Thank you.